Amen. Thank you, David. I uh, commented on his age. He's two years older than me right now. <laughs> Still young, really young. <laughs> But I, one thing I told him went about bending over to get that sand sanitizer, if he's like me, he could just keep rolling. I mean, you know, <laughs> my balance is not too good. It falls so easily. That uh, cell thing, I, I'd be interested in finding that. See, they, but, uh, but it sounds like a Louis Giglio type thing. Remember what he used to do with all this, this stuff? And yeah, he's... We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it, uh, it's good to know the Creator. It's good to know the Creator. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 today. This is a uh, pretty sad church. Pretty sad church that we're going to be studying today. To the angel of the church of Sardis, write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Therefore, remember, excuse me, remember therefore how you have received and heard Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father. And before his angels, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The title of this message, Looks Can Be Deceiving. Looks Can Be Deceiving. And as you saw there, whoops, today we look at the church of Sardis. And, of course, I cannot, because of my twisted mind, not tell you what they call people that live in Sardis. Sardines. Yeah, but... <laughs> Couldn't resist. <laughs> Speaking of fish, I guess. It's a fishy morning. A few things we know about Sardis. Sardis was, an, was a capital city of Lydia. Again, if you, and I ought to put a map up here, I guess, of all the seven churches. Maybe I will when we get through the seven. But this is an important city. It was uh, a safe city, and we'll talk about that. It was founded around 1200 B.C., so it was an old city, an old city. But uh, three facts we know about it that are important to, uh, to what Jesus, the Lord of the churches, has to say to them. First of all, it was a secure city. It was a secure city. One of the reasons it was a capital is because it was pretty hard to attack. The city sat on top of a 1,500-foot plateau. That's pretty high. That was pretty high. There was only one narrow road leading into the city, so it was pretty easy to guard. And the other sides of the plateau were cliffs. So it was a pretty secure city. They, they felt safe there. They felt like nothing could attack them. They were very almost impenetrable by invading armies. So there was a sense of security there. They were safe. Nothing could attack them. It was also a very prosperous city. A 
the prosperous city. This was the place where gold and silver coins were first minted. Uh, you know, we've talked about, talk about the Denver Mint and places like that. They had the Sardis Mint. That's the only one there was. This was the first place they minted these coins for use. It was also famous for industries that were there. You know, we talked about, you know, in uh, Thyatira, the, the dye, that was, the purple dye was what Thyatira was very well known for, but the city of, uh, of uh, Sardis went beyond that. They had carpet, wool, and dye cloth, of course, were their primary works of, of uh, industry. And they were famous for these things. So it was a secure city, impenetrable, no worries. They were very safe. It was also a prosperous city. Plenty of income, plenty of money, plenty of uh, work. You know, the economy was good. And because they were so secure and they were so profit, uh, prosperous, it was also an arrogant city. It was also an arrogant city. Because of their wealth and the feeling that they were invincible, they truly felt in their hearts that they were the greatest city in the world. In fact... That's what they called themselves. <laughs> they called themselves the greatest city in the world. And so to this secure, prosperous, and arrogant city, Jesus comes to speak. And the Lord of the church speaks to them. It's interesting, as we pointed out, how he describes himself as he comes to these various churches. And to this church, he comes describing himself in two ways. He's the spirit-filled one. He's the spirit-filled one. It says that he has the seven spirits of God. Now, that's kind of an interesting way of saying that, so we have to kind of uh, look at what the seven spirits is talking about. Because this is not the only time in Revelation it, it talks about this. In Revelation 1.4, we saw, John to the seven churches are in Asia, grace to you and peace from he who was and is and who has come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. In Revelation 4.5, says, and out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. In Revelation 5, 6, he says, and I behold, beheld, excuse me, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb which had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. It's most likely, you know, and it's, this is kind of why Revelation is so interesting, so hard, because they describe these, these, these things in ways that seem pretty bizarre to us. But it's most likely that the seven spirits are a reference to the Holy Spirit. Read several reasons being, but probably the... the greatest is that uh, seven is the number of perfection and fullness. And so to say the seven spirits would just be a way of saying, you know, the, the perfect spirit, which would be the Holy Spirit. Some have also alluded to a verse in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, which is which says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and, understand, and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Some have thought that this explained the seven spirits of, 
of the seven spirits of God. And they break it down like this. One, the spirit of the Lord. Two, the spirit of wisdom. Three, the spirit of understanding. Four, the spirit of counsel. Five, the spirit of power. Six, the spirit of knowledge. And seven, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Pretty obvious that however descriptive this this terminology is, that he's referring to the Holy Spirit. And so the the Lord of the churches comes to this, this church at Sardis and said, I'm coming to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's important. Because he wasn't just coming as, you know, just a, uh, well, this is what I think. This is coming in the, in the fullness of the Spirit with all the understanding and the power of the Spirit behind him. So this is the first way he describes himself. But then secondly, he says not only does he have the seven spirits, but he has the seven stars. Now we know what that's referring to. But what I would say he's describing himself as the authoritative one. Because we know what the seven stars are, that going, going back to uh, chapter 1 and verse 20. Well, it's not verse 20. I can't find it right now. I'm sorry. You'll have to take my word for it. But, but in chapter 1, it talks about the one that has the seven stars. And this is the churches. The churches. He's coming in authority to talk to this church that needs attention. Because it's his church. It's his church. He's building it. You're familiar with the verse, of course, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, which says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So when he comes to talk to this church, he's coming as the one who's full of the spirit and the one who has the right to speak to it. Because he's going to come with a very strong message. He's going to come with a very strong message to this church and one that is very serious. It's interesting that this is one of the two churches. Whoops. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself in my notes. I'm sorry. The first message he brings to the church is he rebukes the dying ones. He rebukes the dying ones. What he says to them, he says in verse 1, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Basically what he's saying is you are not as good as you think you are. You are not as good as you think you are. Interestingly, and this is where I jumped ahead of my, my uh, notes there. This is one of the only the two churches that he did not find something positive to say about the church. Now, a little later, he'll say some positive things about some of the people in the church. But he didn't say anything positive at all about the church itself. They're putting on a good front. It says, you have a name that you have, that you're alive. They have a good reputation. But they are dead. They are dead. This this has been a hard study for me because Our church has taken a big hit in this past year in many ways. With COVID, some people choosing to leave, needing young families. We've been hit hard. 
And so the question is, is, is our church a dying church? We have to do an honest assessment of those things. And, the, and so when it came to Sardis, it's like, wow, this is, this is painful. Sometimes people can look healthy on the outside and be filled with cancer. Again, I'm jumping around too much. I'm sorry. But just like the city, they were putting on a good front. They think they're prosperous, secure. They are arrogant. But they are dead. Now to where I thought I was going. Sometimes people can look healthy on the outside and be filled with cancer. And it can be true of churches as well. So as I was, I was preparing for this message and I was thinking, are we a dead church? And I come to the conclusion in my heart that we are not. Because I came up with several things that that dead churches don't do that we do do. One, dead churches don't see problems. They think they're okay. They think there's nothing they need to adjust and nothing they need to change, nothing they need to do to improve because they think they're okay because dead people they don't see they need anything and neither do dead churches and certainly dead churches don't care about the problems they don't care about the problems well, things that, that they need to address things they need to improve areas they need to improve in dead churches don't care about those things And dead churches do not pray about the problems. One thing that, and there have been a lot of discouraging things over this past year. Some people have not been in this sanctuary for over a year that claim this church is their church. But one of the things that is encouraging is we have more people coming on Wednesday night to pray than we have for a long time. That's a good thing. Dead churches don't do that. And dead churches don't try to correct the problems. And dead churches don't try to reach the lost. You know, I, and I, as I said last week, It was so encouraging to see so much concern and enthusiasm and care about trying to do something to reach the children and young families. We sowed some seed and we sowed some candy. (laughs) Trying to do something. Dead churches don't, don't care. Dead churches think they are just fine. They need no improvement, no prayer, no correction, no effort. Just leave me alone and let me die. That's not us. We've taken hard hits. And it's been pretty discouraging in many ways. But we're not dead yet. And neither was the church of Sardis because the scripture said they were on life support. (laughs) But there was still hope. He says, be watchful. And strengthen the things that remain. 
there were some things that still remained. Now, we don't know exactly what was going on in this church at Sardis. He doesn't give us details on what was dead about it. But he said there are some things that, that remain that you need to take care of. And in order to come back to life, that's why we sang, revive us again, in case you didn't get that yet. They were to strengthen the things that remain. My wife, in the midst of some of my moaning and groaning <laughs> and discouraging moments, reminds me to be thankful for what we have. Be thankful for what we have. We have good people. Don't moan about the ones that have chosen to leave. Be thankful for the ones that remain. And strengthen them. That's what he says here. That's not what she said. <laughs> but that's what he says here. Strengthen each other. The ones and the things that remain. Are there things we still need to do to, to reach out and everything else? Of course. We aren't, gonna, we aren't going to circle the wagons and say, oh, the, the, just, just us is enough. We're going we're gonna to do our best to reach out to those that are out there. The little kids playing basketball down the street this morning. Yesterday, I stopped and said, hope to see you at church in the morning. They aren't here. Am I going to stop stop in my car and saying, hey, guys? No, we're going to keep, keep working. We're going to keep struggling to bring people in. But we're going to strengthen the things that remain. Well, how do we do that? You exercise. That's how you strengthen the things that remain. That's pretty tough. But in order to do what needs to be done, we've got to get out of the chair and exercise. Do what we're supposed to do. A couple interesting passages along these lines. Uh, one of them is 1 Timothy 4.7. It says, But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward God godliness and kind of a commentary on that verse is Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 through 14 he says for the though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the first principles the oracles of God but you have come to need milk and not solid food for everyone who who partakes only of milk, is unskilled in the word of God, of a word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, by those by the reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You got to think. <laughs> you got to exercise your brain. To know what's right and wrong. To know what we need to do and what, what we shouldn't do. It's some, some things we won't do. But what can we do to strengthen those things which are remain? How can we pray better? How can we learn the scripture better? How can we apply the scripture better? How can we support one another better? How can we do these things? We need to exercise those things, which we do somewhat right now. They remain, but maybe we can do better to encourage one another and strengthen one another and reach, help each other reach the lost. They're to strengthen the things that remain. 
And then it says they're to straighten out their works. <laughs> they're to straighten out the works. Because he says, verse 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which are remain and are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. I have not found your works perfect before God. He says, you're doing some things, but maybe they're not the right things. Maybe they're not the most helpful things. Maybe they aren't the things that I really want you to do. I think we receive two messages from this statement. First of all, do something. <laughs> do something. Now, we used to say, do something even if it's wrong, but that's not, that's not a good philosophy. But we need to do something. And it wasn't enough that we did something on Easter. We're going to have to do something again. And again. And again. And again. We're going to try until the people in our communities and the people in our spheres of influence is sick of hearing us. <laughs> Not that we want to be obnoxious, but we want, to, we want to be reaching them. Do something. Don't just sit around and bemoan the fact that, well, where is everybody? Have you asked them? Have you called them? Have you said we missed you? That was kind of convicting, wasn't it? Do something. And then, like I said, it's not do something even if it's wrong, but make sure what you're doing is profitable. He says, I have found your, not found your works perfect before God. Do something and do the right things. We need to seek God's wisdom. That's why, that's why we need to pray, pray, pray so hard for wisdom and guidance and for open doors. He's got them out there. And no one can shut them. But we've got to find them. We've got to find those open doors and go through. And so he tells this church that thought they were okay. They were secure, they were prosperous, and they were arrogant. I really don't think that that last one, at least, applies to us. But maybe we've been a little, had things a little too good, a little too secure. And maybe it's time to have, a, have our foundation shaken a little bit. So we see the necessity of reaching out, strengthening what remains, and straightening out our works. And so he says to this church, remember and repent. That seems to be a recurring message in all these churches, doesn't it? Remember and repent. Because the danger is, is to fade out. To withdraw, to give up, to quit doing things, to say, I tried that before, didn't work. I'm guilty of that because we've tried. I mean, I've been here since I was a baby, <laughs> almost literally. We've tried just about everything that I can think of, but there's new ideas out there. Some of you guys have good ideas. Let's, let's, keep, let's do them. But remember how good it was to see growth and to see God working. Remember how good it felt when you were working for the Lord. And you were making effort to exercise yourself in building the church, in strengthening the church. Sometimes we get so comfortable 
we just start sucking things out of the church. Or we're not really contributing to the church. I'm not talking about money. God doesn't really need our money. He needs us. He can sell a few cattle on a thousand hills and he can do whatever he wants with the money. But to people, us, he needs us to be actively involved, to strengthening what remains and to straightening out our works. So he rebukes the dying ones and he warns them, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to take you out. We saw what he can do with Jonah. I don't really want to spend three days in a, in a fish's belly. I don't even want fish in my belly, let alone in, to be in theirs. <laughs> but he says, don't make me take you out. So he rebukes the dying ones, but Secondly, the message is he remembers the faithful ones. He remembers the faithful ones. He said in verse 4, you have a few names, even in Sardis. <laughs> that's, that's a sad statement, isn't it? Even in your church, you have a few guys that are alive. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. He remembers the faithful ones. The Lord of the churches recognized that even though the church might not be doing so well, there were certain people that were doing well. And he encourages them, he encourages them with his notice. He makes two promises to them. First of all, he says... They will walk with him. <laughs> kind of remind me of the Indy Garden song. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. I call that the snake song. And he walks with me and he talks with me. That's how people sing it. <laughs> they will walk with him. That's a pretty special place, isn't it? To have Jesus promise to walk with you. The implication is he wasn't walking with the dead ones. They were alone. Even in those that named the name of Jesus that were, that were dead or not, he would not promise that he would walk with them. Now, the implication may be that the dead people weren't even saved. I don't know about that. That's a pretty large leap, I think. But he says, those that have not defiled their garments, they have not died. They have kept their spirit alive. They will walk with him. And secondly, he said, they will not have their name blotted out of the book of life. They will not have their name blotted out of the book of life. Now that's an interesting comment. And that, of course, is in verse 5. If be clothed in white garments, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Now I didn't comment about the white garments, but that was... Interesting because what was the city famous for? Dying cloth. And he says that they'll be clothed in white cloth. All through the book of Revelation, we see that the believers are clothed in white linen, which is the clothing of the saints. They will be clothed in white garments and then I will not blot their name from the book of life. Now i got to talk to you about the book of life because some have mis misunderstood this. That their name could be removed from the book of life and therefore lose their salvation. 
That is not what this is talking about. I didn't really develop this too much because I didn't know I'd have as much time as I got. I should have developed it more, but <laughs> there are two books of life. You've heard me teach on this before, but just to remind you, there are two books of life mentioned in the scripture. There is the book of life, which is mentioned here. And the second one is the lambs. Oops. No, I, I didn't, I really wanted to do this first. The lambs book of life. Now the difference is the, the book of life starts full. The book of life starts with all those the names of all those that are alive. And we know that because Moses even back in Exodus asked that his name would not be blotted out from the book of life. You know, and it starts with everyone that's alive. That's why it's called the book of life. But the Lamb's book of life starts empty. It started empty. It's not empty anymore. Because the Lamb's Book of Life is about those who trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The Book of Life contains everyone who lives. And their names are removed as they die or as they reject Jesus Christ. Their names are removed from the Book of Life and all of Give you a verse on that here in a moment. But the Lamb's Book of Life, start, which starts empty, the names are entered as they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And no place, it talks about blotting the names out of the Book of Life, but no place does it say that anyone's name is blotted from the Lamb's Book of Life. That's an important distinction. Because words matter. Revelation 20.15 says, Anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So those that have died without Jesus Christ, whose names were removed from the book of life, were cast into the lake of fire. But Revelation 21, 27 that it says, There shall by no means enter in anything that defiles or comes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. What a difference in ending for the records. The book of life, names are taken out. And when their names are not found in the book of life, they're cast into the lake of fire. The Lamb's book of life, names are written down. I don't know if the dates are there or not. You know, I always try to tell people to, to write the, the date that they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior down in their Bible. I don't know if the dates are there or not, but he knows. I don't, I don't know the date that I received Jesus. I was eight years old. I, didn't, I don't remember the date, but I remember the day. And I remember the time that my name, Joseph, written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I will not be cast in the lake of fire, nor will you, if your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. So we find by studying this church that churches can appear to be alive and yet can be dead. But the sad truth is churches are only make, made up of people. And just as churches can appear to be alive and yet be dead, so can people. Is where it gets a little convicting. You know, we can look on the outside like like we are, we have arrived. We are, we are great saints of God. 
we got it all together. We got a good testimony, good reputation. People look at us and say, man, there's, I got, that, that person really, really is walking with the Lord. And yet, maybe inside it's not true. Got a reputation that says that you're alive, but you're dead. Maybe you feel like something over your salvation experience has died in you. And you feel like the psalmist David who said in Psalm 50, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. You can put on a good front, but be dead inside. Well, he gave advice to the church, and the same advice goes to us. Remember and repent. Remember and repent. I'd say that that's the most common theme of all the churches. Remember and repent, remember and repent, remember and repent. Ephesians 5.14 says, Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. Paul told young Timothy, as a young man, he says, I, I remind you to stir up the, the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. The terminology that is stir up the the gift means to fan the flame. You know, you try to get a fire going, you, you fan it. Add that oxygen and add that, that movement. And maybe you're here today and you need that. Fan the flame. Let the Holy Spirit work in you and cause you to come alive. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Strengthen the things that remain. Straighten out the works that you do. Repent. Remember. Come alive. So my advice from the scripture here is don't be a deadbeat. Don't be a deadbeat. But live for Christ. Heavenly Father, we certainly pray for our church. We pray, dear God, that we don't just look alive, but we are alive. We know we've got issues. We know we've got problems. We know we've got needs. And Lord, that's why we're asking you to fill those needs. Give us wisdom and understanding. Give us ideas. Give us methods and things that you could use. We don't want to manipulate or play games. We want to bring people to a reality of knowing Jesus. But we need you. We need you to guide us. We need you to help us. We need you to bring them. Lord, make sure that we strengthen the things that remain. Make sure that we personally, as individuals, strengthen the things that remain and fan the flames so we burn hot for Jesus. Father, may you challenge us and encourage us with these words. Let he that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit says.